If you're a gamer that wants to have the coolest temperatures and you desire to have the longer battery life that AMD computers have to offer, then you've probably been exposed to the hype of the newest laptop to offer AMD's best chip yet, the Alienware M17 R5. Is it time to toss my old M17 R3 and replace it with this one? You may have already seen my more fun and entertaining unboxing video of this laptop, but this video is the serious one that'll help you decide if it's actually worth buying. Keep watching for my take on the design and build quality, display quality, performance benchmarks for both creators and gamers, sound quality, a look at the internals, actual battery life, quality tests on the speakers, the webcam, internal and external thermals, fan noise, pricing breakdowns, and comparing it to its competition, my overall top pros and cons, and now finally VR tests as well. There's a lot of really important information to unpack with this machine, so please watch the whole video before making up your mind on purchasing this very expensive computer. But if you already know a lot about this machine, feel free to skip around the video using the timestamps. Now price-wise, this machine starts at just under $1,600 for the all-new AMD Ryzen 7 CPU and only a 3050 Ti GPU, but the maxed out version that we got with the all new AMD Ryzen 9 6900HX processor, a 3080 Ti GPU, and 32 gigabytes of 4800 megahertz of DDR5 RAM costs a whopping $3,000. Now the closest equivalent Alienware X17 R2 with an Intel processor, that machine costs about $3,600. There's several reasons for that though, and we'll talk about that here in a sec. And right now the closest equivalent MSI GE76 that you can actually get right now is $300 more than that at $3,900. As you may have seen in my review video for that machine though, the speed and bells and whistles of that laptop are insane. So it kind of deserves a higher price tag. Design and build quality. Now, when it comes to the design of this laptop, I think that Alienware did a fantastic job aesthetically. We'll get to functional design here in a sec. The dark side of the moon material on Alienware laptops I've always found to be very premium looking. It's a very soft matte black material that reflects light in a pretty appealing way. On the top of the lid, we've got a nice glowing Alienware logo right there in the center, complemented by a large embossed stenciled reflective 17 there in the corner. And beneath that, the most bold and attention grabbing portion of this design, the iconic RGB Tron bar wrapping around the ports and hexagon ventilation. Upon opening the lid, you're greeted with even more animated RGB, a rather large touchpad, and more hexagon ventilation there at the top edge. This touchpad was pretty comfortable to use and gave us some smooth feedback, but this plastic material didn't feel as premium as that glass touch pad that I got spoiled with on the X17 model. But the build quality overall was pretty solid. Screen wobble and screen flex was pretty minor. The screen hinge was a little stiffer than I prefer though and made opening and closing the lid with one finger just a little awkward. The chassis itself is pretty sturdy though and has a nice weight to it and also has very minimal flex. Now when it came to the keyboard I opted for the Cherry MX mechanical keyboard that you also saw me test on the X17 models. The tactile feedback, satisfying clicks, and excellent travel distance makes it my favorite keyboard when it comes to the feel of it. It's also the loudest keyboard though, so keep that in mind if you need something more discreet. But what really actually upsets me about this keyboard is that they've removed secondary key illumination from this upgraded model. And not only that, there's no number pad anymore either. Two downgrades from the previous version. This makes my M17 R3 from two years ago look like the upgrade in this category. Moving on to the ports. On the right, we've got two USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, this one with PowerShare, and then some ventilation on the back. We've got some more ventilation on both sides, a USB-C 3.2 Gen 2 display port 1.4, another USB-A 3.2 Gen 1 port, an HDMI 2.1 port, and your power port. And then on the left side, we've got some more ventilation, an ethernet port, and your headphone and microphone jack. Now moving on to the internals. So right here we've got our two main chassis fans, our Wi-Fi card right there in the middle, our two sticks of 4800 megahertz of 16 gigabyte DDR5 RAM sticks for a total of 32 gigabytes, and then our two SSDs. The max you can go here is six terabytes total. And then there at the bottom are massive 97 watt hour batteries sandwiched in between two pretty tiny little speakers. So how well did this battery perform? At 50% brightness in battery saver mode with volume all 
the way down, a 60 hertz refresh rate, Optimus on, and RGB effects turned off, we only got three hours of HD streaming. And with those same exact settings, we only got four and a half hours with our idle and web surfing tests. And it took a full two and a half hours to recharge back to 100%. These numbers were very underwhelming, and it leads me to believe that there was something wrong with my battery as my Intel machines, which typically perform worse with battery, actually performed better than this machine. I've seen other reviews too with much better results than this, so I'm going to assume that it's an isolated incident. So how about the sound quality? At 80 decibels, it was just as loud as the other gaming laptops, and I'd say the quality was just slightly above average. Although nothing compared to the speakers on the Razer Blade 17 or my wife's MacBook Pro. I've just come to accept the fact that most gaming laptops are gonna have lower quality sound. The webcam. So this is what the stock microphone and webcam look and sound like. As you can see, not very impressive. I'd say comparable to my flip phone camera from 15 years ago. I really don't understand why gaming laptops that are this expensive have such horrible webcams and speakers. So you can see just as average and basic as last year, 720 p with no noticeable improvements movement was pretty blurry as well and honestly the quality appears to have not even slightly improved for my two-year-old m17 r3 i really don't understand why top dollar gaming laptops in 2022 don't all have 1080p webcams by now okay so let's talk about the fan noise in quiet mode we got 43 decibels when gaming in performance mode it moved up a little bit to 47 decibels and full speed, 51 decibels. This was a couple decibels higher than the other gaming laptops that I've tested when in quiet mode, but for full speed and performance, it was actually about four to five decibels quieter. Yes, it is great and all that these fans are pretty quiet, but did they actually do a good job removing heat and keeping the computer cool? Externally, the laptop did not feel very hot compared to the others. The touchpad and the palm rests were relatively cool with the majority of the heat understandably in the upper vent area. And just like most gaming laptops, a lot of the heat escapes out the back, so that portion was pretty warm as well and i know it looks pretty hot on the bottom in these thermal tests but that's more looking past the external metal chassis and into the internal temps the bottom metal did not actually feel that hot in my lap despite these numbers and you can see here that temps only in the 80s by the side fans means your mouse hand will still be comfortably cool during heavy use temperatures in gaming were pretty impressive as well keep in mind this graph for cpu temps isn't exactly comparing apples to apples as all these machines are 12th gen i7 processors and this machine's Ryzen 9 is more comparable to i9 processors. Ryzen 9s and Intel i9s are always going to be the hottest CPUs. You can see that the MSI GE76 was actually the lowest here in a majority of the games. Even more so in our 4k tests the i7 GE76 absolutely shined above the rest. So much so that it actually justified me trying out the i9 version of the GE76 as well. You can see here comparing those two at 4 4K resolutions that they were actually pretty close to each other. Half of the games were cooler on the i9 MSI GE76 and the other half cooler on the Ryzen 9 M17 R5. When it came to the GPU temperatures, the M17 R5 did even better. It had the lowest temperatures on a majority of the games with our 1080p tests and the lowest in almost every single game when we tested it in 4K. But the big question you're all wondering, how well did it actually perform at those cooler temperatures? Which leads us to performance and gaming benchmarks. For Geekbench 5, we got a single core score of 1521 and a multi-core score of 10,351, lower than all the Intel machines for this benchmark. For Cinebench R23, which simulates its raw rendering power, we got 1515 for the single core and a multi-core of 13,982. 3D Mark, we got an overall score of 12,425, a graphics score of 12,714, and a CPU score of 11,012. And for Browserbench speedometer, which measures the speed of web applications, we got a score of 208, kind of right there in the middle compared to the other machines. And just like those 12th gen Intel machines, its Gen 4 SSD was also just as incredibly fast as the ones that they had. With about 6.8 gigabits read and 4.8 write, that's pretty impressive. And for creative professionals, these were our Puget benchmark scores. For DaVinci, 1130, Premiere, 799, Photoshop, 1131, and After Effects, 774. Fairly average numbers for DaVinci and above average for Photoshop, but rather low in Premiere and After Effects. 
Although actual export times were pretty similar though when running my 10 minute export tests. Unfortunately, this laptop is the first computer that I've ever tested that could not finish my After Effects export tests. No matter what I did, it crashed every single time. When it came to actual gameplay though, we surprisingly got very similar results for both Witcher 3 and Red Dead 2. They were pretty much neck and neck with our HD 1440p and 4K tests with the GE76 standing out above the rest. Apex and GTA 5 though, it proved to be a little slower than its Intel counterparts. At 1440p, it was still a very pleasant gaming experience at 170 frames per second in Apex and 122 in GTA 5. It did struggle quite a bit though in Warzone and Cyberpunk with only 55 frames per second in max settings when playing at 1440p and 70 frames per second in Warzone. And the biggest gap in frames per second compared to its competition showed up with Call of Duty Black Ops 4 and Forza Horizon. And four. You can see that playing a game at HD settings was the largest difference with it getting closer and closer as we increase the resolution. Since all these machines have i7 processors, here's a more fair comparison showing how big of a difference this Ryzen 9 machine is compared to an i9 MSI GE76 at 1440p. The i9 MSI GE76 absolutely crushes this machine in pretty much every other game. One thing that was kind of interesting, for both Call of Duty and Forza, the CPU was using very little power with just sporadic jumps to 40 watts every now and then. And I double checked multiple times and the computer was definitely in performance mode. So I'm not quite sure why those games were seemingly unstable with this machine. It does only have a 240 watt power brick as opposed to the Alienware X17 and MSI GE76 with 330 watt power bricks, but it still should be consistently using more than 15 watts with those games. The games that push the power of the CPU to its max performed much closer to its Intel competition. It may just be some sort of issue with my specific computer because people commented on my unboxing video that their CPUs were running the correct amount of power on those games. Consistently, not sporadically. But how well did it do in VR? So this is the VR Mark Orange Series benchmark test. I mean, it looks pretty cool, but I'm getting a lot of choppiness. I wouldn't exactly say that this computer is the best for higher end VR with maxed out graphic settings. And our VR Mark score confirms that this machine struggles with higher end VR as well, with a score of only 10,637, several thousand points lower than the 12th gen Intel laptops that I tested in VR. Now, as far as the quality of the display, it really wasn't all that bright with a measurement of only 320 nits. Colors still look decent, although not as color accurate and vibrant as a photo editor would like it to be, with only 78% Adobe RGB, although motion at this 165 hertz refresh rate looked pretty nice. Software. On your homepage, you can see that we've got the same overclocking profiles that you normally find on an Alienware machine, and then we've got a bunch of thermal profiles that you want to use based on whether you want your computer to be quiet or louder but with better performance, or if you're wanting to save on battery. And then under your FX tab, this is where you're going to go to control all of your customizations and animations for your per key RGB lighting on the keyboard, on the Tron bar, and even the Alienware logo on the back lid. Here under the Fusion tab is where you can adjust your overclocking profiles. Unfortunately, with this machine, you're only going to be able to do that with the GPU in this advanced view right here. You can also adjust the thermal profiles to further customize exactly how hot the computer needs to get before the fans kick in. And then under the Power Management tab, you're basically left with the same power settings Windows has with with the addition of the alien effects options. Now my overall top cons for this computer. Number one is performance. For a machine with these specs, I honestly expected higher FPS and better benchmark scores. Pretty disappointing, honestly. When Dell labeled this the best AMD Advantage laptop of the year, I think I got my hopes up just a little too high. Number two, the keyboard downgrades. Although I love the feel of the Cherry MX mechanical keyboard, the removal of the number pad and secondary key illumination is unacceptable. I know a lot of people that use their computer in dimly lit rooms, so not being able to see your secondary icons very well is a huge downgrade. Number three is the ports. I honestly found them to be pretty lacking for the price point of this machine. Only one USB-C port total in this machine. And another downgrade from the last version, no more micro SD card reader. It's also disappointing that the display port doesn't directly connect to the GPU. Meaning if your monitor uses one of those ports exclusively, you're out of luck when it comes to getting the highest performance. Now my overall top pros for this computer. Number one is the thermals. Being an AMD machine, I knew that it was going to run cooler, but still I was pretty 
pretty impressed with these temperatures under heavy load. And my number two pro is the price. Yes, I did expect more from the fastest AMD CPU that's available for a laptop, but it was also more affordable than the other i7 machines that I tested. So do I actually recommend this machine? On games that actually use the right amount of CPU power, it actually performed pretty well. Even though it was still slower on those games too, the fact that it was several hundred dollars less than those machines makes it quite a bit more appealing. I just can't recommend this machine though after all of the features that they removed. It really just kind of upsets me how many things this computer doesn't have that my M17 R3 from two and a half years ago does have. Out of all the gaming laptops that I've tested, my favorite is still the MSI GE76. It's also at the price point that I consider the ceiling for 95% of consumers out there. I would never want to spend more than what that machine costs for a computer that's just slightly better. If this video helped you in any way, please consider purchasing one of the computers that I do recommend through one of the affiliate links in the comments and description below, as I get a small commission at no cost to you for every single purchase made. And that's a major part in keeping this channel going and creating better and better content for you. Guys, remember every week I do a giveaway that randomly selects someone who's interacted with this channel or filled out the form in the description. So make sure to like, comment, and subscribe with notifications turned on to keep an eye out for that as well as staying up to date with all of my latest tech reviews. And the winner for this week is... Carlos Gonzalez. Thanks for watching, guys. I love you guys. God bless.